gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about the person and the work of Christ is something that not only saves us, it continually saves us and sanctifies us and it infiltrates our life. Well, I invite you, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and uh, I'll I'll introduce myself because I don't assume that all of you, I'm not often in the first service hour, um, all of you know who I am. My name is Nathan Fox. I'm actually the pastor of teens here at this church, student ministries pastor. Um, So right now, the teens are down in their service hour being taught, and I have the wonderful opportunity to be in here with you this morning teaching from this text. And I'll, I'll confess, um, Pastor Nathan asked me if I would teach on this Sunday morning, and I'll tell you what I told him originally. I'm honored, thank you, but no. Um, and, and, in my, and it's actually really hard to say no when you get an opportunity to stand in front of the church body and teach, but if you know anything about s- student ministries, uh, this particular time of year is the busiest approaching the busiest time of year. We have camp and mission trips coming up, and we have next month, we have our graduating seniors, an entire weekend where we're pouring into them, celebrating them, along with just the regular rhythms of Wednesday night, Sunday morning, teaching with the teens. It just seemed prudent for me to decline a gracious offer to teach this morning. But after I told him no, I I prayed for a couple of days and, and, and legitimately thought in prayer, Lord, is there something? If I were to say yes, if I were to send him a text back and change the answer, if he would still want me to teach, if, if, is there something that you've been pressing on my heart, something that you have really been reminding me of lately that would be fresh for me, but also helpful to your people? And so what I'm doing this morning is I'm going to take you through a text that's probably familiar to many of us in this room in Matthew chapter 16, certainly a text that I have thought of often over the years of following Christ, but a text that has been very pertinent, has been very relevant to me these last handful of months, and I pray would be a blessing to you, Matthew chapter 16. This morning, what I want to speak on, the title of this sermon, if you are a note taker, The title is A Confessional Church. A Confessional Church. And I assume for many of us in this room, those listening, when we hear the word confession, a lot of times we run to perhaps mental images of a a potentially awkward conversation. A a, a weird one-on-one dynamic where we're sitting down with a person or a group of people and we're just kind of bringing the skeletons out of our closet that they would know. The the real us being exposed, the truths of ourselves being highlighted so that we can invite brothers and sisters into our lives that would actually be helpful for us, that they would hold us accountable. And certainly, that is not just a good practice in the church, that is a necessary practice. But that's not the kind of confession that I'm talking about this morning. When I use the word confession, This morning with you, here is what I mean. If you are taking notes, here's a very simple way to understand this term confession this morning. It's a statement. A statement that sets out essential religious doctrine. A statement that sets out essential religious doctrine. Think of the early church. The early church had their creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, statements Statements that were put together by these early church fathers that said, this is what we believe. These are the doctrinal pillars upon which our faith rests. And and if you start cherry picking, if you start removing aspects of these doctrinal statements out, if you like some things that you want to keep, but you take some things out that you don't like, then all of a sudden the entire foundation is faulty and the entire house falls apart. Statements that are bedrock doctrines. But I don't want to just be a church that 
has a cognitive understanding of confession and doctrine. I, I, I want us to be, I hope that we are, a confessional church. In other words, confessional meaning this, that we don't merely stop at just knowing the, the doctrines of Scripture, but that we take the truths of Scripture and apply them. Take these doctrines and apply them into everyday life. A statement that you can take into every discouragement, every personal frustration, every sin, failure, every horizontal glance at the globe where you see the carnage and the depravity of man around us. A statement that will sustain you in all your highs and lows. A statement that will sustain you even in tragedy and death. A statement that will prove itself to indeed be rock solid. And the question perhaps is then this. Is there such a statement, such a confession that exists? So with that, I turn your attention with me this morning to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to look at verses 13 through 20, and we're going to read of a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples in a very particular area that we'll talk about here shortly. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, the text says this. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples a question. Who do people say that the Son of Man, referencing himself, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And the disciples said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus says to them, but who do you, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied with a confession a statement. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then Jesus strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now before we dig too deeply into these sets of verses, a set of verses, I want to draw our attention to a couple of context uh, reminders that would actually be helpful for our understanding. Uh, I want to draw you to, some, to, a, to a textual context that gives an idea of what's taking place, why I think this particular portion of scripture is here. If you actually look at the first verse of chapter 16, if you, if you were to take note of the first verse of this very chapter, you would, you would see that there's a particular group of people that don't often come together, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And yet, in verse 1 of chapter 16, they come to Jesus, and their motivation is to test him, as it often was, to test him. And the way that they wanted to test him was this, show us a sign, give us a sign. They're not so much asking as much as they are demanding, show us that you are who you say you are. Now, the sad truth of that is this. This is well into the ministry of Jesus. To this point, he has made it very abundantly clear with how he teaches with authority and the signs that authenticate his teaching ministry who he is. And the Pharisees come to Jesus in essence saying, prove you are the Messiah. Prove it. And if you were to take a look at verse 21... Just after the passage that we just read, you would see that from that time, the text tells us, Matthew writes for us, Jesus begins to show his disciples that he's on his way back to Jerusalem, back to those same 
Pharisees and Sadducees, scribes, religious leaders. And at their hands, he will suffer many things, even to the point of being killed. These are the things that surround the text that we just read. Prove you're the Messiah. And Jesus is beginning to educate his disciples that he's going to die. So prior to and just after this text, we see opposition from the outside. We see death on the horizon for Jesus. So the question then is this, what is going to sustain this ragtag group of imperfect disciples? What is it that they must hold on to in the midst of such opposition and carnage, death, doubt, oppression? What will uphold them? You'll take note, I hope, with me in verse 13, we're told that Jesus is in the district of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi, a highly pagan area, highly Gentile area, where historically, well before the time of Christ, but certainly also in the time of Christ, myriads of false gods have been worshipped in this district, in this area. Historically, it's believed that Baal has been worshipped here. And I think we'd also be wise to look at the name itself, Caesarea Philippi, and ask the question, how did the name come into being? Caesar. Uh, If you remember, the, the Roman Empire is the top dog in the known world at the time. And Caesar, as head of the Roman Empire, who considers himself to be God, Caesar gifts gives to Herod the Great, that same Herod who slaughtered all those babies in the Bethlehem region at the birth time of Christ, that Herod is gifted this region by Caesar. And in honor of Caesar, a temple is erected in his name by Herod the Great in this area. Herod's son, Philip, takes over and takes over this region, hence the name Caesarea, after Caesar, Philippi, after Philip, to distinguish itself from Caesarea Maritima, which is on the coast. So these are the gods that are represented here. You have Baal, historically, you have Caesar, who's worshipped here. In the time of Christ, you have the Greek god Pan, this half-man, half-goat god that the Gentiles in that region worshipped. We actually went on our Israel trip, uh, what, a month and a half, two months ago. We went to Caesarea Philippi, and we actually took a picture, Ashley and I, of Caesarea Philippi. I want to show you a picture, because it'll give us a context of kind of where this region is, what takes place here. So this is my wife and I. In the area, this is probably not where Jesus would have had this particular conversation, but this is the area in which Caesarea Philippi is located. You would notice it's actually a very lush, beautiful green area, but I want to actually more so draw your attention to the background. You would take note, if you could see the background, there's a big cave, and just to the right of the cave, there's a group of people, a group of tourists, kind of gathered around this niche in the rock face. And this particular niche would have been where the Greek god Pan would have been worshipped in the time of Christ. And if you were to look at that large cave just over my wife's shoulder, it is believed by many pagans of the time, it is believed that that cave was the gate to the underworld, the gate to Hades. That were you to cross over into that cave, you have now entered through the gates of hell. This is a highly pagan area. Gods of all sorts of peoples have been worshipped here. False gods. This is a dark area. This is red light district for a well-respected Jew, let alone a Jewish rabbi teacher. So I find it fascinating Why then does Jesus, a Jew, a rabbi, the Son of God, why does he take his group of disciples here into the dominions of darkness surrounded by all sorts 
of paganism. Perhaps the conversation that we just read has a large part to do with this. The conversation begins with a question. Who do people, who do people say that I am? In other words, he's asking his disciples, when you have conversed with other people, or when you have heard other people talking about me, when you have heard the crowds having discussions about my identity, who do you hear them saying that I am? What is the expectation of the people? And the disciples reveal a list of names, some specific names. Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Kind of laughable considering Jesus actually stood beside John the Baptist, but I digress. Some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah or another one of the prophets. And the answer the disciples give actually, actually really gives us a great insight into the messianic expectation of the people. There's actually a common thread between the names. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah. All three godly men. Godly men who stood in the face of great political corruption. Was not Jeremiah essentially a voice alone? A, a man who spoke the word of God in hard and difficult times in the presence of a corrupt king at the, at the very risk of his own life? Did not Elijah stand as seemingly as he thought alone in front of Ahab and Jezebel and the prophets of Baal? at the very risk of his own life? Is not John the Baptist a contemporary of Christ? Is it not he who stood before Herod and rebuked an incestuous relationship? And we actually know that cost him his life. Godly men who stood in the face of political corruption, and this is what comes from the crowd, which gives us an idea of what they expected of this Jesus who they expected him to be, the kind of Messiah they are looking for, a political revolutionary, a, a zealot of sorts, who will take us out of the oppression and the bondage of Roman occupation into a new freedom. But I don't think, my opinion, I don't think that Jesus is particularly asking this question because he's as much interested in the crowd's expectations, as much as I think he's more fascinated to get to the second question that he asks. Jesus, always the great conversationalist, leads into a second question. Now having his disciples' minds around his identity, he then turns the question to them. No longer who do they out there say that I am, but then he looks at his friends, his followers, and says to them, but you... You, the collective group of disciples around me, you, who do you say that I am? I would argue, I have told the teens many times over the years, I can think of no more important question that can be posed to man. Who do you say that Jesus is? The... The answer to that question is literally an answer that will indicate whether one is in the faith or not. The answer to that question, if, if, if that question were to be posed to you as a collective group in this room this morning or posed to you on an individual level this morning, and all of us must answer this individually, and all of us prove this out individually, what we believe about our answer in the way that we live our lives, who do you say that Jesus is, is a matter of literal eternal life and death. The answer to that question, this cannot be overstated. This is perhaps the most important question that can be posed to any of us. If someone were to ask you, who is Jesus? What would you say? And Peter, it always is Peter, speaks up on their behalf and says this confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. A statement, a 
simple statement, packed with essential religious doctrinal truth. You are the Christ, the Christ, the the Messiah, the anointed one of God. And what is it that he, Jesus of Nazareth, is anointed to do? What is it that he has been sent to do? Is he a political revolutionary as the people assume? By the way, if we just assume that Jesus is, as the crowds expected, a political revolutionary, then frankly, he has failed. Because on his ascension back to heaven, the Jewish people are still under Roman occupation and for many years after. Is Jesus just that? Is Jesus just a social mover and shaker? Is Jesus just a good moral teacher? Is Jesus just a simple prophet? Like Jeremiah, Elijah, John the Baptist. No, he is far more than that. He has been sent to do what no pagan god nor king can do. To save his people. Not from the throes of Rome, but from their sins. Something that no mere sinful man can do. No no power of Caesar can do what Jesus is able to do. No concoction of an idol made by the hands of men like Baal and Pan can do what God the Son can do. Only God incarnate, only Jesus the Messiah could be that perfect sacrifice. And we know that the, the work of Jesus, if you're familiar with the Gospels, if you're familiar with, the, with the, the Passion Week that we just celebrated just a couple of weeks ago, that this Jesus, this sent one of God, this God in the flesh takes on the form of humanity, lives a sinless life, climbs a hill that is really not his to climb and yet does so with his eyes on a cross Where on that cross he will bleed, literal blood, spilled, the Lamb of God, sacrificed on our behalf. The wrath of God reserved for us now poured out onto the Son, that he will drink that cup, that he will pay that sin debt, that his blood will atone, his blood will cover This is what he has been sent to do. This is the mission of the sent one of God. To save his people. And through that, restore, give access for his people to his father. Peter actually says in this confession, you are the Christ, you're the sent one. The son, the son. Now, if time would permit me, if I could park here longer and dwell on our Trinitarian God, I would. But it is sufficient, and I hope logical, for me to say to you this morning that as Peter confesses that Jesus is the Son, the implication here is this, that if there is a Son, there must then be a Father. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, all in nature, God, all of same essence all fully God, and yet, and yet, beautifully, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, beautifully distinguished in their roles and relationship one to another. Consider, for a moment, if you would, the relationship of the Father and the Son. God the Son, in obedience to God the Father, comes for sinful man and will do the unimaginable, He'll die. Why? We get, we get asked that question quite a bit. Why would Jesus die on the cross? I have a little four-year-old son now, and we talk about that often. Why would Jesus die on the cross? And oftentimes we give the answer, well, because he loves us, and he has come to seek and to save the lost, because he, he wants to bring us into a relationship. Yes. Yes. But that's not entirely all of the answer either. Consider Jesus' own testimony about why he does what he does. In John chapter 4, 
the story of the woman at the well, when Jesus meets the woman in Samaria. Do you remember when the woman runs back to the town to go tell everybody about this Messiah that's told everything that she's ever done? She runs back to the town and the disciples approach Jesus and they ask him if he's hungry. Would you like some food? And he essentially says, no, I've I've already eaten. And the disciples, I'd imagine, look at each other rather quizzically, looking around, wondering, where did he get the food? There's no food here for him to eat. And Jesus responds and says this, my food, my sustenance, is to do the will of the one who sent me. We also see in John 14, verse 31, Jesus say this, I do, I obey As the Father has commanded me. Why? Hear his reasoning. Why? So that the world may know that I love the Father. Why did Jesus come? Why did God the Son come? Did he come to save sinners? Yes. Did he come to bring us into a relationship with his Father? Absolutely. But it is also to be understood that God the Son came in obedience and lived a sinless, fully obedient life because he loves his Father. It was going to glorify his Father. But is this a one-way directional love? The relationship between the father and the son. Is this, a, is this a son who's looking for the affirmation of his father and it not being returned? Well, perhaps then we'd be wise to look at Philippians chapter 2 where Paul gives us the humiliation of the son, the humiliation of Jesus where he lays out for us one of my favorite passages to consider. The humiliation of God the son where Paul writes for us that though he, Jesus, in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but he emptied himself he humiliated himself he humbled himself took on the form of a servant born in the likeness of men being found in that form he humbled himself listen to this by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross but Paul does not stop there therefore Because of the obedience of the Son. The humility of the Son on full display in glory and love for the Father. Therefore, God has highly exalted on him, on the Son, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven And on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God the Father gifted, granted in this divine sovereign plan from eternity past gave to the Son a mission that only the Son could do. That he would die on a cross, he would be risen from the grave How much does the Father love the Son? He turns our attention. All of us one day will look at the Son and will glorify with our tongues and with our knees. We will see him as he is to be seen, that he is indeed Lord without parallel. This is what the Father gifts the Son. The Father and the Son, what a harmonious relationship of love. And all of this, all of this screams to us that we have a highly relational God. Our triune God is eternally relational, esteeming one another in that love. And listen to this, working out a plan of salvation to invite us, us, into that love. This is not a cold and calloused God. Christian, In Christ, the Father looks at you and smiles, is pleased. Our God has done the unthinkable. He has died on a cross and through that death invites us, through that death and resurrection invites us as enemies to the very table of the family and says, 
you have an unmatched love for all of eternity. You are invited into this love. You are invited into life. Peter says you are son of the living God. In a region of pagan deities, dead directions, dominions of the demonic, here comes the light of the world. Here comes the living God, our God, the creator, the sustainer, the giver of life. Our God through who? Through, through, through his death, crushes death. Our God, through by his resurrection, brings life. You are the living God. Christian, we have an eternally living hope. Is this not what we celebrated two weeks ago at Easter? A risen Savior, a victorious Savior. And that because the grave is empty, this is a life that we partake in, not just in the future, but a life that we enjoy and thrive in now. Listen to the words of Christ in John 14, 6. Again, a famous verse, but here, the testimony of the Son. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. This is our confession. He is the Christ. He is the sent one of God. He is the savior of sinners. He invites us into a relationship that we don't deserve. And he gives us life without end. This spills out of the mouth of Peter. Not all of this. I I have no doubt Peter has a very basic understanding of what he's saying here. But Jesus looks at Peter The confession having just come out of this fisherman's mouth and says this, blessed are you. Blessed are you. Why? Because flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. This is not a conjuring of your own mind. This is not just something you mentally put together. Notice this. Who revealed this to Peter? My father. I told you the father delights in the son and delights to showcase his son. My father has revealed this to you. And Jesus says to Peter, verse 18, you are Peter. A little bit of wordplay here. On this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If we're not careful, we can assume wrongly that Jesus is looking at Peter and putting way too much on this unstable fisherman, that the church is going to be built on the back of Peter, that Peter is going to be the chief foundation for this enterprise that is the church. And though Peter has an influential part to play in the church, and though he is an influential person in the story of the early church, to be sure, It is not Peter the man on which the church is built. It is on the confession that spills out of Peter the man on which the church is built. The confession. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 reminds us of this. That the apostles lay a foundation. A a doctrinal foundation. But Paul says this. It is Jesus who is the cornerstone. The cornerstone. You remove the cornerstone, the entire building or structure collapses. It is Jesus that is the foundation, the bedrock of the church. The church, Jesus says here, is not to be built. It is not built on politics. The church is not built on right social movements. Those have... Certainly at times we can have conversations around those things, but that is not where the church is built. The church is not built on the conjurings of man's ideas of what is a flashy church program that could draw people through the doors. Youth pastors like myself would be wise to remember the church is not built on pizza and dodgeball. 
The church is not built, as Paul reminds us, on the eloquence and the charisma of men. The church is built as she maintains fidelity to this confession. If you abandon this confession, I'd say it this plainly, you're not the church. You can be a lot of things, but you're not the church. Certainly not the church that Jesus is going to bless, that Jesus is promising to build here. Because the church knows Jesus intimately, not just facts about him, but knows him intimately and proclaims him confidently. And the promise that Jesus gives to the church is this, I'll build you. I'll build it. And hell itself, the gates of hell, and he's in a dark area, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Satan has no answer for a confessional church. He has no greater trick up his sleeve. He's defenseless against this kind of faithful people. Even death, even death loses its sting. This is the strength of our confession. But I told you, I don't want to just be a people who know the confession, although we should know our confession, we should know our doctrines. I I want to be a people, I want to be a person who takes these beyond this wall, takes these truths into my home, into my workplace. So what could that look like? Let me give you a couple of examples of what that looks like individually, what that looks like corporately for us. A couple of days ago, um, I have two little boys. I have a four-year-old, I have a two-year-old, almost two-year-old in a month. Um, my youngest, Colton, is, it's been a rough couple of weeks with him. He's strong-willed, he's temperamental, he gets it way too much from his dad. He, he just had a rough couple of weeks, and he's nonverbal. Very hard to understand what's going on with him. Is he sick? Is he just got a strong personality? Is he a sinner? Yes, probably all of the above. A couple of nights ago, um, Fridays, I, I'm with the boys throughout the day, and it got to bedtime, 8 o'clock or so, and I'm putting, I'm, I'm getting my oldest ready for bed, and I hear my youngest, I, and he just had a bad day. He's just been crying and fussy all day. And I hear him screaming in his crib from his room. He's thrown out his bottle. He's thrown out his elephant. He's just not having it. And you parents, you parents know this, I'm sure. I hope I'm not the only one. When you just feel like, I have had it. I just hit my, my limit. And you can feel, you can feel the, the frustration and the anger rising in you. And I remember, I'm getting Landon ready for bed. And I told Landon, I, s- I said, hold on. And I quickly got up and I was stomping across our land. I'm, I'm like a little two-year-old throwing a tantrum. I'm stomping across the landing and I get to my two-year-old son's door. And here's what was about to happen. I was about to bust that door open, assert my authority, tell him who's boss and tell him to go to bed. That was what was about to happen in anger. What's crazy is this text came to mind, knowing that I'm about to teach on this in two days. I had to stop myself. And and actually, it wasn't me stopping myself as it was, I think, the Holy Spirit prompting me. And I I had to think about this anger, did Jesus, did Jesus not bleed for this too? I don't have to walk in there angry. The old me, the, the, the previous me, the, the pre-Jesus me would have. But I have a living hope. I'm set free to live better than that. God has opened my eyes to a new way of life. Again, all these things, standing at the, at the door of my two-year-old son, and I walk in calmed by the truths of Scripture, and I walk in to see my crying son, and I go and put my hand on him, and I just stroke his head and pray for a couple of minutes until he finally calms down. Now, if you're not careful, you'll think, man, he's a great dad. There are many times, there are many times where I am not that way. 
Far too often, I have to get down on the level of my son, my four-year-old especially, and admit this to him. Your daddy failed. Your daddy's not perfect. Your daddy needs Jesus. What am I doing to my son? I'm speaking the truths of this confession to him. And I pray, modeling for him, he also needs Jesus. This is how we be a confessional people. In our marriages, in our parenting, in our workplaces. Individually, this is how we are confessional. We speak the truths of what we know to be true of Scripture into our own lives so that we're not just saying amen here, we're living it out there. But corporately, how could we be a confessional people? I want to draw your attention with the the time that I have left. I want to draw your attention to, if you're not familiar with our church property, there is a, a memorial I've been reading through the Old Testament, we're reading all about how the Israelites set up stones of memorial, stones of remembrance. There's an Ebenezer behind the church property, just on the other side of the road that runs behind the church. An Ebenezer, a, a thing for us to remember, a thing for us to look back on. An Ebenezer that was actually built at the turn of the millennium here on this church property. Thousands of years after Peter uttered this confession, And the people of Heritage Baptist Church put on this Ebenezer a plaque. And I want you to hear, as I close this morning, I want you to hear the confession of our church that was put down 23 years ago. And I want you to hear the faithfulness of Jesus to build his church as his people have been faithful to the confession. Here's what the plaque says. We, we as Heritage, are part of the family of the Almighty, the following of the Holy One, the habitation of the Spirit, the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast, the decision has been made, we have stepped over the line. Our past is redeemed, our present makes sense, our future is secure. We are finished with clouded minds, hardened hearts, smooth knees, wayward feet, low living, cheap giving, sight walking, worldly talking, small planning, colorless dreams, tamed vision, and dwarfed goals. We no longer want or need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, popularity, or praise. We don't have to be recognized, rewarded, or regarded. We now live by faith. Lean on his presence, walk in patience, persevere through prayer, and labor by his power. Our face is set, our pace is fast, our goal is heaven. Our road is narrow, our way is rough, our guide is reliable, our mission clear. We cannot be bought, compromised, lured away, turned back, detoured, derailed, or delayed. We will not give up, let up, look back, slow down, back away, or be still. We will go on until he comes and work until he stops us. And the question that I ask is, how can we do all of these things? Here's how it finishes, very simply. We are disciples of Jesus. This is our confession. We take this beyond this room into our lives.